Well, we are uh, continuing our study in the book of First John. Uh, John is doing a, a discussion uh, about love. That's the section we're in here. And today I'm just going to pick up, start off right away where we left off and see how far we can get today. I've got there listed through verse 12. We'll see what happens. So let's try it. Just pick it up, starting in verse 9. This is where we, uh, we finished verse 8 last week, uh, 9 through 12. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now, this is in the context of what we studied last week. Love each other. John is laying out an intention. Love each other. Christians, love each other. And along with that, he lays out the evidence. This is evidence and proof that you truly are born-again believers. This is true this is proof that you have been born of the Spirit. This is proof that you know God if you love one another. That's what John is talking about here. This is what we read last week. I'll just read the verses uh, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another. That's what he says. Love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone, who's love, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He tells us to love one another. We must love one another. We have to love one another. This is how we know that we belong to him. This is how we know that we are born of the Spirit. This is how we know that we know God, that we love each other. And after he tells us to love each other, he describes for us the greatest example of love, a demonstration of what it really means to love. I'll read it, verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. The example, the demonstration of love, of God's love to us, for us, among us, is he sent his son. He sent his son. Now remember, he is love. We're talking about God is love. God's love. This is God's love for us. And it doesn't to do us much good if we just leave it there. God is love. Some people, some people who claim to be Christian, I definitely know that the unbelieving world loves this verse. They love it when it says God is love. That's all they want to talk about. They thrive on the idea that God is love, and they make up all kinds of feel-good religious ideas, all kinds of feel-good philosophies, and all kinds of feel-good applications to go along with it. God is love. You can do anything you want. They use that to justify anything. Because God is love, you can just do it. It's a great philosophy to have to them. But his nature, God's nature, which is what we looked at last time, is love. It's not just an abstract concept. It's not just a philosophy that you can tag along with anything that, go, that you do. God is love. Oh, yeah, wonderful. No, he showed it to us. It has feet. He revealed it. That's what the word means. He showed it to us. The Greek word means to reveal, to make visible, to make known, to make clear, to make manifest. It's the same word that we looked at earlier in John chapter 3, and it's used many other places. Uh, John 3, verse 5 and verse 8. You know that he appeared. Excuse me. Jesus appeared. You know that he appeared. That's the word. He appeared. He showed up. He made himself known so that he might take away our sins. The reason the Son of God appeared, there's the same word, was to destroy the devil's work. God has made his love known to us. He put it out there in the open. It's visible. It's clear for everyone to see. God has showed us his love. Here it is. A concrete example. This is it. Verse 9. <clears throat> this is how God showed his love among us. See? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now, you've seen this before. This is really 
many, many times throughout the whole New Testament. In fact, it's through the Bible. God has revealed to us his, his word, his, very, and his love, and it's very similar to what uh, Jesus told Nicodemus back in John chapter 3 where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God so loved us that he gave his son. God loved us that he sent his son. God loved us and sent his son. That is the concrete example of love. And it says here, his one and only son. Now, I want to deal with this word for a second. Um, it's, got, it's a compound Greek word. The first word is mono. It means one. You, monopoly, one. You know that? Same word. And the other word is a word that means birth. So the word means one birth, but it really means one and only, one unique kind. One, only one of its class, the only one of its kind, unique in kind. Something that has only one example in the category. That's what the word means. Christ Jesus alone is the Son of God. The eternal Son of God, who existed in the beginning with God. Remember, that's John 1. In the beginning was God, and the Word was, with, were, the, word was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that's the same one. The unique and only Son of God. Now, some earlier translations, some of your old English translations, in fact, it's an old English word, uh, only begotten, it says. The word begotten, I think, is confusing in English, at least in modern English it is, because it sounds like Jesus has been born as the Son of God, or it sounds like Jesus became the Son of God. Some cults have even used this word begotten to say that Jesus is the created Son of God, like a created being, was not from the beginning, not from all eternity. But that's not the word. This word, one and only, means that Jesus, it proves the doctrine about the nature of Jesus Christ. He is the God-man, the one and only, the unique Son of God. Eternal, pre-existing, God in heaven, the Son took on flesh. The unique, one and only Son of God. And it says God sent him. The Father sent him. That's a word that just means, well, it's the same word that's used transliterated into the word apostle. It means a sent one, someone who is sent. He sent him to us. He sent him to us. He sent him among us. He sent him into the world. He sent him into the world of men. He sent him into the world of fallen men. He sent him into the world of fallen sinful men. This is not just a doctrine that people made up. God sent his son into the world of fallen men, and Jesus says this over and over again. This is all through the Gospels. If you just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's, it says this many times. I'll give you one. John 7, 28 and 29 says, Jesus still teaching in the temple. Temple courts cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. You know I'm from Bethlehem, but I'm not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So God, the Father, sent the Son into the world. He sent him into the world. It's not a man-made thing. This is not something that people just conjured up on their own so that they could come up with a nice uh, religion to believe in. God sent him into the world. God sent him into the world of lost, helpless, hopeless, not looking for a Savior, not expecting a Savior, not even wanting a Savior. That's the world that God sent his son into. A lost, helpless, hopeless world of sinners. Do you know why we were lost and hopeless and helpless? Because we're dead. Spiritually dead. We have no hope. We're spiritually dead. We cannot breathe on our own. We cannot do anything on our own spiritually because we're dead spiritually. No knowledge, no understanding, no desire to know God. In fact, not only do we have no understanding and no desire to know him, but we do know about him as fallen sinners in the world, dead, spiritual, spiritually dead people, is that we hate him. Man hates God. The world hates God. We love our sin. We love our sin and we hate God telling us to not sin. Dead men love their sin. 
They're not alive spiritually to know anything. Now, I do need to, I need to jump back for a second. I know that we preach this all the time, and I know it gets wearisome. Does he ever talk about anything other than how sinful we are? All we talk about is how sinful we are. How, don't you get tired of always putting ourselves down on this level? Why do you always talk about us being spiritually dead, Pastor? I've actually heard this. I've heard this from people. We want too much credit for ourselves. People just want too much credibility for their own value, their own goodness, their own importance. Not have to deal with that we're dead. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, too. I would love, I would really love to be able, and I would much rather find something good in us to talk about. I would love to be able to find something about us that's worthy. I would love to be able to find something about us that's noble and pleasant. Y'all are just great people. Now you can go home and smile about yourself. I would love to do that. But then, if I did that, I would not be able to speak of God showing his love among us. If I sent you home feeling good about yourself because there's something good in you, something worthy in you, something noble in you, then I can't tell you about the love of God. What would you rather have? Your dead sinners, now we can talk about the love of God, or your great people, forget the love of God. I would not be able to speak to you the gospel unless you were dead. Because John states the purpose that God sent his son. He tells us the purpose, God sent his son. He says he sent his son into the world that we might live. That's why he sent him. We weren't living, we weren't living. We weren't, weren't living before he came. Now he came and we can live. You were dead, then he came, now you can live. You couldn't live before he came because you were dead. That's what it means. He sent his son into the world that we might live. By God sending his son into the world, we might have life. We might have spiritual life. We might have eternal life. God so loved us. God, this is love God showed us his love. This is how he did it. He sent his son, his one and only son, the only uh, eternal son of God into the world that we might live. Unending life. That's why he came. That's why he came. Jesus said, I'm the, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. Man, this is all over the place. Even though he dies, he'll, he'll live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. God showed us his love to us and sent his son to us to make us alive spiritually. So we would let, live forever spiritually in his presence with him forever. That's why he came. That's why he sent him. He sent him to us that we might live spiritually forever. I would much rather preach that to you then God is love. Everybody just go home and have a good day. You're, you're sweet people. I like you all. You should like yourself. But the gospel is God sent his son to make us alive. God sent his son so that we would live. We're dead. We're not good. We're sinners. We're wicked. We're evil. But God sent his son to make us alive. And changes. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Christ came to give us life. Not behavior modification. Not a set of rules. Not to make us all churchgoers. Now, those things do happen. People who are alive change. People who are alive, he writes his law in their hearts, and they long for and desire to live by those laws. And they love to fellowship with God's people, so they are churchgoers. 
But the purpose is to give us life. In Christ Jesus, you are now alive to God. You're alive in Christ Jesus. You're in a relationship with him because he was sent by God for that purpose. He said it in John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what God has done for us, sending his son, Jesus Christ, to make us alive when we were dead, we were dead to God, for God to send his son into the world to make us alive so that we would not be dead to God is love. That's love. That's the definition of love. That's the manifestation of love. That's the appearance of love. That's the making clear of love. That's God showing his love that he sent his son to make us alive when we were dead. Only in that, me only in that setting does love have any meaning. Love doesn't mean anything apart from that. No, God does do everything he does because he's love. I mean, he gave us the creation. He gave us families. He gave us many things to give our lives joy. And he does all that because of his love. Because he is love and love comes from him. We saw all that last week. But only in the gospel, only in the gospel of Jesus Christ, by him sending his son, truly shows the richness and depth and extent of his love. You will not get the extent of his love by playing with your kids. Even though he gave you your kids to have a good time with. It's wonderful. You will not enjoy the extent of God's love by enjoying the beauty of the ocean or whatever it is you enjoy because God made it beautiful. You only can enjoy the extent of God's love by seeing what he did and sending his son to make us alive. See, God took the initiative. God did it. God took the initiative to rescue us. God made the move. He took the necessary and effective steps to a secure for us and for himself our eternal salvation. God did all that. He took the steps. He did it. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. It was far from us. That's actually in the definition of love. It says it in verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You want to get down to it? God sent his son into the world not because there was anything lovely in us and we loved him and we were worthy of anything good that he did for us. He didn't wait for us. He did not wait for us to have any kind of love for him. If he had waited for us to love him first, guess what? It would have never happened. If God had waited for us to love him, he would have never come. Jesus would have never come into the world. He loved us when we didn't love him. He loved us when we didn't care about him. He loved us when we were enemies with him. His love for us does not depend on our love for him or our obedience to him or anything else in us. His love for us does not depend on anything in us to get it. Because we're enemies. I mean, it, Paul talks about this in Romans 5, 6 through 10. You see it just the right time when we were still powerless <clears throat> powerless means we couldn't do anything. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in rebellion to God, while we were still disobeying everything he told us, while we were not doing anything to please him. Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified, that means to be declared righteous in his sight by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him by the death of his son, see, his son's death on the cross 
reconciled us, made us friends, made us friends with him. No longer enemies, reconciled. His son did that. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So God didn't wait for us. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And his love for us was not uh, him wishing the best for us. His love for us was not him doing all he could do to give us a fighting chance. His love for us was not doing all that he could do to give us a second chance. His love for us was not doing all he could do to give us an opportunity to get, it back, get our act together and get it back to him. His love for us was none of those things. His love for us was not that we would do it back. I need to say this because this is in the text. This is, going, this, is, this is my favorite part. His love for us has secured not a possibility, not an opportunity, not a chance. His love has secured for us our complete forgiveness of sin. His love for us has not only uh, secured for himself, uh, has secured for himself that he would not only be able to forgive our sins, but his love for us secured for us that he would be totally satisfied and would forgive us of our sins. Catch this. The love that God had for us in sending his son was to secure that he would indeed completely and totally forgive our sins. Not just make it a possibility. Not just make it a hope so. Not just make it wishful thinking. It is going to happen because he sent his son. The text says it in verse 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, I want to talk about this some. We talked about this of, uh, back in January when we were in John chapter 2. It says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice. And you go, oh, Lordy mercy, what does that mean? See, so it's not about what God has done to, uh, for us to make it possible for man to be saved. This annoys me so bad, so bad. So much horrible theology is that God sent his son Jesus to die to make it possible for men to be saved. That's not it at all. It's about what God has done to save us. Not just a possibility. It's a reality. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen because of this thing called the atoning sacrifice. It's going to happen because of this thing called the atonement. The atonement actually does save. Jesus sacrificed himself to atone for us. And by atoning for us, it saves us. It doesn't just make it possible for us to be saved. It saves us. That's what atonement is. Romans 3.25, Paul said it. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, the same, same words used there, through faith in his blood. Hebrews 2.17, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers, Jesus Christ, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. See, the high priest had to offer sacrifices. Now, he's the faithful high priest. He's the ultimate high priest. He is our high priest who offered himself. Faithful high priest in service to God that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. <coughs> I like it. The same word is used in Matthew chapter, I mean, excuse me, Luke chapter 18, verse 13, where the... Uh, Pharisees saying, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like this tax collector over here. I'm not like this sinner over here. And the sinner, the tax collector, wouldn't even look up to heaven. He was beating his breast, and he was crying out, uh, stood at a distance, would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy. There's the same word. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, atone for me. And Jesus said, that man went home justified. That man, that man went home righteous before holy God. All he was asking for was an atonement. I need atonement. 
And Jesus is that atonement. So here it is. It's the old English word. Some, it's in some of your Bibles. Some, some translations, I guess, still use it. Propitiation. Anyone ever heard that word, propitiation? Has anyone ever used that word in a sentence in your whole life? Apart from a Christian doctrine argument. Anyone ever use that word anywhere in any conversation you ever had with anybody? Propitiation. I just say that because it's an old English word. We don't talk like that. That's not our word. The word means appeasement. The word means a satisfaction. Appeasing the wrath and gaining the goodwill of an offended person. We talk like that all the time. You've got to appease someone when they're mad at you. You've got to do something to satisfy their anger at you so you can be back friends with them again. And they won't be mad at you anymore. A sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it to his favor. To, pay, to appease, to placate, to pacify. That's why you put a pacifier in a baby's mouth so they'll be quiet. It calms them down, melts them. They're not mad anymore. We don't know why they're mad. They're just screaming bloody murder. Give them a pacifier, they calm down. Same, that's what the word means, to avert wrath. Many ancient pagan writings highlight that's the meaning because they talk about appeasement of an angry God by offerings. So when you talk about atonement, when you talk about a satisfaction or an appeasement, you basically have four elements in this. An offense, that's the first one. There's an offense that has to be taken away. You did something wrong. Two, you have a person who is offended. The person who was offended is the person who the offense happened against. Third, you have the person who did the offending. The offending person did the offense against the offended person. And fourth, you have a sacrifice or some other means to make atonement for the offense, to make satisfaction so that the person's not offended anymore. You have to make a sacrifice so the offended person is not offended uh, at the offender by the offense that the offender made against the offended person. You have to satisfy them. You have to make them happy. You have to take away that, that problem that you have. That's the idea here. Here's the gig. We, you and me, people on the planet, people who live our lives, have sinned. We have committed sin. We have done what is wrong. That is the offense that we have committed. We've committed a sin and offended a holy God. He's the one who's offended, <coughs> and we have offended him. We violated his commands. We violate his laws. He tells us how to live our lives, and we don't do it. He tells us what to do. We don't do it. He tells us what not to do, and we do it all the time. We have offended. We have offended by our sin, by our rebellion, a holy God who gave us his, his word, his love, and gave us his laws. We're guilty. We deserve his wrath. We deserve his judgment. We deserve that. But God's wrath has now been appeased. How do I know that? He sent Jesus Christ, his son, to sacrifice himself, to remove from himself the offense that was against us. We, 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 made the, we made the offense. Now Christ has made the atonement. Now God is not offended anymore. That's what that means. You understand that? The atonement is now so good, so righteous, so noble, so everything that Jesus Christ's death on the cross, his sacrifice of himself by shedding his blood, has now taken away God's offense at us. turned away his wrath from us. Christ Jesus died on the cross and by his death has turned away God's wrath that is against us. That's what atonement means. So that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He appeased God's wrath. When it says he is the atoning sacrifice, that's what it means. God is no longer angry with us. His wrath has been satisfied by the work that Jesus did on the cross. 
He's satisfied. He's satisfied. He's no longer angry. Christ satisfied God's wrath against us. Check this out. For each and every sin. Every sin. Christ's blood shed on the cross satisfied God's wrath for every single sin that you and I have committed against him. I've got a bunch of them. I don't know about y'all. The youngies don't have as many as I have yet. Some of you got more. He died for all of them. His blood shed atones for all of them. God is not angry at you for any of your sins, ever. We were sinners, rightly deserving God's wrath. His anger had to be poured out on us because we were sinners, because we were in rebellion against him, because we're not obeying his commands, because we're wicked, because we're ungodly, all of those things. It says it in Romans 1.18. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the, ungodly, the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You have to understand that you are ungodly. You have to understand that you are wicked. You have to understand that you are unrighteous. You have to understand that you are a sinner. And that God is angry with you. You deserve his condemnation because of his wrath against you for your sin. You have to understand that. And if you don't understand that, you won't understand Christ's atonement. His atonement, his sacrifice of himself, shedding his blood to die, takes away the just wrath of God against us for every sin. He takes it away, takes it away, takes it away. God is satisfied. He sees his son on the cross and dying for us, and now God is not angry with us anymore, all because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood. In fact, his blood is the atonement. Romans 5, 9, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with God's riches of grace. Revelation 1.5, to him who loves us and has, been, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Colossians 1.20, he made peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's atonement. That's all the same thing. That's atonement. His blood satisfied God's wrath. And now because of God's wrath being satisfied, he can reconcile with us and take enemies and make them friends. Because God, because God is satisfied, he can forgive us of our sins. Because God is satisfied, he can purchase us for himself. Because God is satisfied, he makes peace with us. We are no longer enemies with him. We're at peace. Jesus' blood is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. God's anger had to be appeased, and it was. Christ has atoned. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Every sin, all of them, every single one, each and every sin you and I have committed, God's not offended with anymore. God's not angry with anymore. God is no longer angry at sinners for whom Christ's atonement is applied to. Now, quick version, God has already in his purpose of election in eternity past applied this atonement to his people. That's all I'm going to say about that. But as far as you and I are concerned, in the here and now, we live in the here and now. I'm breathing the air that's, I'm breathing the molecules that are in the air right in front of me right now. That's the here and now. As far as you and I are concerned, how it applies to us now, how this atonement has any effect on you now, Jesus is who you must believe in for that satisfaction to be counted for you. You have to believe him for it to work for you. You have to believe him or else it doesn't work for you. You have to believe him. You have to call on him. You have to trust him. You have to cry out to him. You have to follow him. That's all the same thing. 
Your sins will not be covered if you do not believe. Your sins are still applied to you, and God is still angry with you in your sins if you don't believe. <clears throat> and you will suffer condemnation and judgment for it. God is still angry with everyone who does not believe. That's what Jesus said in John 3, 36. We always read verse 16. How about verse 36? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. See, the atonement is everything. But for it to be applied to you and me, you have to believe. To believe him. You have to believe him. You have to trust him. You have to come to Jesus yourself and call on him to save you from your sins, knowing that his death on the cross was for you. You have to believe it. If you don't believe it, you're condemned. God's wrath is still on you. You will suffer eternal judgment by God's wrath if you don't believe in his son that he sent to take away your sins. That's, that's the gospel. And John applies that to us as our motivation to love one another. He sent his son to die for us that our sins will be atoned for. That's our motivation to love one another. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Since God so loved us, how did God so love us? He sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If God loved us like that, we ought to love one another. He repeats what he's already said before, too. He preached this back in uh, chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Very similar thing, very same concept. When he says, we ought to love our brothers, check this out. The word ought is not just a suggestion. Like, this is what you ought to do. You want my idea? You want my advice? This is what you ought to do. This is a suggestion for you. That's not what it means. <clears throat> this word means to be bound with a moral obligation. We're under obligation to love each other. You don't have a choice. You're obligated to love each other. That's the word. That's what the word means. We have to do it. Not optional, not a suggestion, a moral obligation. Same word is used in Romans 13, 8. Let no debt, same word, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. You have an obligation to love one another. You have an obligation to love one another. You have a moral obligation to love one another. You have to do it. If you are covered by the atonement of Jesus Christ, you have to do it. This is how you know you're born of God. Remember last week, verse 7? This is how you know you know him, if we love our brothers. You love each other. Now here, John seems to emphasize the manner of that love. See, he said, God sent his son as the atoning sacrifice. So if he loves us that way, you've got to love one another. I said it back then, I'll say it again. I was about to skip something. I doubt that anyone ever in this room, anyone ever listening to my sermon, either here live or on a live stream, will ever have to sacrifice your life and give your life physically for another brother. Probably not ever going to happen. It could happen. It might happen. If it does happen, be willing to do that. That's, that's, that's ultimate love. Lay down your life for your friends. Lay down your life for each other. Sacrifice your life for someone else. That may be true. And even if it is true that you do have to do that, it certainly won't be on the same category as atoning for their sin. You probably got more sin than they do anyway. You gave your life for them. That's great. You loved them. But you're worse than they are. 
So it's not going to be anything atoning, anything like that. But loving each other ought to be in some kind of a similar sacrificial way. He says, if God loved us this way, since God so loved us, it really means since in the manner to the extent that God did love us, you should love each other. How did God love us? He gave himself for us. He sent his son for us. He sacrificed his son for us. That's how we ought to love one another. God loved us and gave us the ultimate sacrifice. And guess what? We weren't worthy of that sacrifice. Was anybody here worthy? Does anybody here deserve that? Does anybody here uh, think God owed it to them? That's the point. We weren't worthy. We did not deserve God's love. We had nothing uh, to re re requite to him. We had nothing to give back. We didn't love him first. He loved us first. Just like that. Just like that, now we're supposed to be the same. Just like that, we do the same. Paul calls it, be imitators of God. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to, and sacrifice to God. Same thing John's saying. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God, we ought to love one another. Because honestly, now I like, like I say this every time, some people are easier to love than others. Y'all know who they are. Some people are not easy to love at all. So it's like you sit on the other side of the room when you see them come in. Right? None of us here deserve love. I cannot stand it when people say, I deserve something good. You don't deserve anything good. You certainly don't deserve love. And you don't deserve love from God, and you don't deserve love from each other. You don't deserve my love. I don't deserve your love. But God loved us anyway, and he saved us. He made us his children. He brought us into his family with each other. He made us all the same family. And since love comes from God, and God is love, and God has made clear what love is, <clears throat> sacrificing his son for us, if he sacrificed his son for us, what is it for us? What is it? What is it for us to show just a little bit of love to each other? I mean, it ain't like you're really going to have to give your life for each other, are you? Maybe, maybe one day, I don't know, but it's, that's not the point. The point is, can't you just give a little bit of love to each other? Sacrificial love? Give of yourself to do something for somebody else who does not deserve it? Give yourself for somebody else who's not worthy of it? Give yourself for somebody else who annoys you? They don't love you, they mistreat you, they might speak evil of you, they might try to harm you, they would ruin you if they could, maybe. I hope nobody here wants to ruin anybody. But if they did, wouldn't it be something that Christ died for you to atone for your sin and you just did something sacrificial for the very person who was that way to you? That's what he means. That's what he means. We are obligated to love each other with the same kind of sacrificial giving of ourselves for their good. We are obligated to love each other by giving of ourselves so that someone else that we're giving our love for benefits. We are obligated, morally obligated, to love one another with some kind of sacrificial giving that blesses them so much they are filled with joy. You fill somebody else's life with joy by loving them sacrificially. That's what John means. If God so loved us, we ought to love the brothers. If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. If God loved us when we were unlovely, and if God loved us when we were wicked, if God loved us when we were in rebellion against him, it's nothing for us to love one another, it, it, each other, is it? Is it? Small stuff? Little bit of stuff? You don't ever have to do anything like God did. 
You can't do anything like God did. He did the ultimate sacrifice of love. He showed us his love by sending his son into the world to take away our sins, to die for our sins, to sacrifice himself for our sins. All you have to do is love your brother and give, make their life a blessing. So, before you go home today, think about someone around you. If you know them, especially if you know them, and you know them in kind of a way, it's like, oh, yeah. Think of something you can do to love them sacrificially. I'm going to read verse 12, and I'm going to try it a little bit, but I'm not going to finish verse 12 today. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That's, been a, that's a puzzling statement to me. In fact, uh, the commentators I read, that's a puzzling statement for a lot of them. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, this is one of the most difficult texts he's ever read. Like, what? You're the most brilliant preacher I've ever heard. This is the most difficult text you ever read? What, uh, God, no one has ever seen God? And the point is, is that why did John put that in there? He's talking about what Christ did. He's talking about what God did to send his son for us. And then all of a sudden he throws in a statement in there, no one has ever seen God. God is invisible. You can't see him. Why does God add this in there? No, we want to see God, right? Do we not? We want to see him. In fact, he's already told us back in chapter 3 that we will see him. When he appears, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. We'll see him in his true form. But that's not yet. That's another day. No one's ever seen him now. Why is that in there, John? I'm going I'm to briefly, briefly say this. We're going to pick back up on this next time. None of that's happy yet. Until, until then, what do we got? I, I can't see Jesus how he really is yet. That was 2,000 years ago. John and James and Peter got to see him on the Mount of Transfigur cha Transfiguration, changed into his face, shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. They saw him as he really is. No one else is going to see that until then. But until then, what do I have? What do you have? Each other. That's all you got. Nobody here has seen God. Anybody seen God? Anybody seen him? See what he looks like? See, John's point is this, and then I'm going to stop. Loving, this seems to be his logic. It's way easier to love people and know people who you can see. It's easier to love people that you can see. It's easier to know someone that you can see with your own eyes, close by, physical contact. I'm in close proximity to you, and I can see you. That's easier to love than someone who I've never seen personally with my own eyes. I, I, I can love someone close by. I don't know how to love someone I've never seen. So how do you love God whom you've never seen and yet not love your brother who's right here in front of you visibly. How? If anyone neglects or turns away from or minimizes or sidesteps this moral obligation, a duty that you ought to love your brother, if anyone minimizes that, then there's no other claim to have a relationship with God. You've never seen him. How can you say, I have a relationship with God? You've never seen him. But there's all these people that he's put in front of you who you do see. If you minimize the contact to love them, how can any relationship with God even be had? It can't. Loving people who are unlovely, loving people who are unlovely, loving people who annoy you, loving people who sin against you, loving people who are rude, loving people who do all kinds of things that are not right, each other. Unless anybody wants to claim they don't ever do anything wrong with it to anybody else, right? 
loving people around you who are unlovely proves that God is in us. Loving people who are unlovely proves that God lives in us. This is how we know. Now, I'm going to pick up on that next time. That's all i got time for today. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that you've given us your word. Praise you for your uh, grace to us to let us be here to hear it. Lord, I pray that you will uh, apply these things to us. We will definitely understand what you have said. That we will understand your love for us. We will grasp it. We will embrace it. We will enjoy it. We will love that you sent your son to take away our sins and to sacrifice him in our place so that we would be, uh, your wrath against us would be removed. Thank you. But teach us that. Teach us to, to know that and embrace that. And may everyone here call on him today and believe him. For his glory. Amen.